If you're using your hymn book, the first Noel on that first verse. The
Welcome to church this morning. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to a great time in the, ha- in the house of the Lord. And thank you for being a part of all of it. And we're going to pray and uh, open the service. And I'll give you a few announcements, keep you up to date on a few things. I want you to be praying for um, Pastor Presnell uh, here in the area. His uh, son had tragically lost his life uh, just in the recent days before Christmas. We're certainly praying for that family. Ask the Lord to strengthen them. And uh, so as we go to prayer, we'll remember that request. But then let's pray together that the Lord would meet with us this morning. Father, we do pray for this grieving family that you would help them. Lord, what a uh, tragedy that very few of us even understand. A few in our midst do. But I pray that you would comfort and bless and be especially close to them. And then, dear Lord, though, we know that you're the one that can, and I pray you would help them. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless this service with your uh, presence. I pray, dear Lord, that you would meet with us. Lord, there are so many needs right here in this room represented. And only you can meet those needs. You can speak to hearts and bless and move people. And I trust that you would. I pray that you would uh, do a work in each heart that's needed desperately this morning. Well, thank you for it. Thank you for gathering us together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. And uh, we do want you to uh, want to welcome each of you. If you're visiting with us for the first time, you're, you are our guest. And we're certainly thankful that you're here, maybe first time or first time in a long time. Uh, on the bulletin that you got on the way in, there's a guest card on one side of it. If you didn't mind to fill that out with as much information as you're comfortable with. And then in the uh, lobby, you'll see there's a guest services counter out there after the service. If you just drop that by, there'll be somebody waiting to greet you and give you a gift just for being our guest. We want to say thank you for being here. And uh, we've got to meet other guests that are are here with us, that they're uh, just from out of town. Uh, He's no guest, but we're good to have Larry Trent back with us after knee surgery. And uh, so thankful to see him out and about. And uh, we're so glad to see Brother Anthony Rogers back there, Brother Dan's uh, son and daughter-in-law Jana. It's good to have family in. I see Brother Wes Mullins and his uh, family. So good to have folks visiting with us today and others. We're just so tickled that you are here today. Thank you for being in church. And uh, we want to give you just a couple of announcements, let you know what's happening this evening, a Lord's Supper service at 630. And uh, we'll be a, a, a quaint service. It'll be a beautiful time together as a church family. And so that'll be a normal time at 630 this evening. But uh, we'll look forward to all that goes on. And then this week, we'll be getting back to pretty well normal schedules, the uh, Wednesday night prayer and Bible study. We'll have an extra emphasis on prayer. Uh, that'll be our last service of the year. And uh, so we want you to come and be in here, ready to pray. May bring some extra prayer requests with you and spend some extra time with the Lord. And we'll have a good time together there. But those are just some of the announcements. There are some Bible reading schedules out in the lobby on the table to the right. And I uh, want to encourage everybody to get one. Uh, there some there for youth, uh, some for teens, some for adults, different plans, chronological and whichever order you want to read through. But it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, endeavor to try to read through the Word of God in a year. And uh, I meet so many Christians that uh, love the Lord, but then when they actually start talking about the reading of the Word of God, you know, we are Bible believers. You understand that? But there's many Christians who've never yet read it through one time. And I say that not to scold us. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. But you ought to, be, ought to read it through. And uh, there's, some again, some uh, plans back there for youth so they can read through the New Testament in a year. That's a wonderful endeavor for a young person. And uh, so I want you to make those things. They are available to you. Take one, and I believe it will help your walk this year as we get started. Hard to believe, but... Uh, 2021 is about almost a memory, and we're getting ready to get into the new one. But we need to do the same thing in the new one that we're supposed to be doing in this one. That is, seek the Lord, follow Him, raise our families in the right way, uh, behave ourselves according to the Word of God. And so we trust that you'll be encouraged to do that. Well, those are the announcements that we wanted to give. But I want to say thank you to everybody who had a part of the Christmas Eve services. We've had a wonderful week here at the church. Uh, last Wednesday, Brother Kyle spoke. If you didn't get to hear him because you weren't here, challenge you to go back and listen to that. Watch it online, uh, or archived uh, off of the website sometime. He did a great job, and he and his wife are now with the uh, young people down in the Berean classroom, first through sixth are down there. And uh, so if you do have your children in here with us, there are some children's classes just down the hallway on the next song. If you want to slip down there, you're welcome to. They'll be well taken care of. But uh, we're just, uh, we had a great week. Uh, that service 
service on Wednesday and then those candlelight service on Christmas Eve that uh, we had God blessed us in a special way. And uh, my wife and I were rehearsing as far as our family, how much God blessed us over the Christmas time, just that uh, the day of Christmas, Christmas Eve. And I trust that you had those same experiences and uh, we're not done yet as seen by my tie. I want to try to exp- exp- uh, exp- spread out just a little longer and uh, I'll preach something about the Christmas message this morning. And thank you again for being here. Brother Dan, won't you come lead us one more time? If you're able to stand together with us, we're going to sing hymn number 106. Seven, God rest you, merry gentlemen. God rest you, merry gentlemen. Let nothing be stay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power.
so much, Jared, and praise the Lord if that isn't love. What a wonderful song, and thank you for singing it, Miss Carmen. Thank you for playing, and what a joy to just think about this, and as you notice, Brother Dan transitioned to think about not only Christmas songs, sometimes we can get so keyed up in the Christmas season, and well, we should, but forget, even in the celebration of it all, that it is the great story that makes it special. Not just family getting together, and I'm thankful for that. I love it, and I know many of you love the same. I love all of the uh, regal regalness of it. I love all of the uh, get-togethers, love all the eating, all of the rest. You're like the one fellow said, I'm so glad all this food is going to be gone. But I noticed he was grabbing three or four more bites of fudge as he was saying that. <laughs> I was like, it doesn't look like you're too rushed for to get that out of here. But uh, he said he's just going to get that weight up to where he can really 
let that New Year's resolution kick in. You know, you got to have a lofty goal. You get that weight up to where you want it, and that way it looks impressive when you bring it down. But in all of the celebration and all of the fun, it is still the greatest story. It's the story of Jesus Christ. Tell me the story of Jesus. And we've gathered again to tell it one more time. The last Sunday in the year and uh, the last Lord's Day that we get to celebrate together before we see another year kick over. And uh, here we're going to do the same thing that we've done all the rest of them, and that is try to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, you can find your place there. In Luke chapter 2, we'll read verse number 7. I did hear a story while you're finding your place in Luke 2 of a lady who was out doing some Christmas shopping, and she uh, lost her purse. And as she lost it, then she realized she did, but not soon enough, and she couldn't find it. But no worries, there was a a young boy that uh, had got it and returned it and took it to her, and she was so thankful. She was so appreciative of it. And she looked down in the purse, and she said, oh, that's funny. She said, I, I knew I had a $20 bill laying right there on the top. And she, he said, or she said, now there's $21 bills instead of that 20 And he said, well, that's right, lady. He said, last time something like this happened, the lady that I gave the purse back to didn't have change for a tip. So... Smart boy, smart boy. He's, uh, he's ready on his ball, on the ball, on this game. Luke chapter 2, verse number 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I want to take this one last opportunity before this season, not done, but before we move on, so to speak. And ask, do you have room? The old question we used to have at churches, no room Sunday, mean we'd try to pack everybody in on the time when all of the kids did their Sunday school programs and uh, they, they did their plays and different things, no room. But I ask that question again, and I want you to look back over this last year, and as quaint as the question is, I believe it's just as convicting as it is quaint. And when you ask yourself this question, did I have room for the Lord? Oh, yeah, I go to church every week. I do this. Yes, I understand. But did we have enough room? Now, we've all seen little plays where the boys and girls played the parts of the Christmas story. I watched this one, as many of you have. And uh, this little boy was reluctant. He didn't want to be the innkeeper because he'd heard that he rejected and said, no, there's no room at the end. And now th there, there's different... Um, commentators out there, and this may very well be true, that say the inn would have been more like a guest room in a house that would have been some relatives of the family. And true, maybe that's the way it worked out, but regardless of whether it was a guest chamber for family members or whether it was just truly an inn like all of us have seen on plays before, the truth of the matter is somebody was in the place that would have been more suitable for a young lady that was getting ready to have a baby. And so you've all seen these, this little play. I watched one time this uh, boy was the innkeeper, didn't want to be, and he felt so sorry. And as Mary and Joseph came up and she pleaded her case, and Joseph did, and, and he said, no, there's no room, they don't have any. And then afterwards he did what his little, the director of his Sunday school said not to do, and that was he ran over to Mary and said, listen, you can have my room. <laughs> All of us would have liked to have been that little fella. And regardless of whether... It was a guest room or whether it was an inn as you would traditionally think of in our culture. The truth was that there was no room at the inn. I want to just look through and see two, a couple points, a couple settings necessarily, I guess. One is I want you to see what's happening. And so as we get started this morning, I want you to pray with me and ask the Lord to bless us over these next 15, 20 minutes. And then at the conclusion, we'll have the invitation. And then we've got a baby dedication. We'd like to be a blessing to a family here today. And uh, all that, that would make, we pray that would glorify God. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful for the chance to be here. This is, this is our family as the vernacular of the day. These are my people. Lord, not because we own one another, but because we belong and Lord, I'm thankful to be amongst our crowd. It's wonderful to be in the church family. It's wonderful to celebrate a special occasion that's special in and of itself, but then, Lord, it's even more special because we're around people who we identify with. 
I pray that you'd bless our time. Lord, I pray if there's one in here amongst us or two or 10 or 15 that aren't certain that there's ever been a time when they received the, the Christ child, Jesus Christ, who grew and died on that cross, they've never received him personally as their Savior. Lord, I pray you would show them today that that's what they desperately need to do. Bless our time. Bless the word into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I want you to see number one, you want you to see what's happening. First of all, there's taxes being collected. Of course, we know the story so well. It's the only time that taxes are ever looked upon favorably when people look at the Christmas story. Oh, not your taxes, their taxes. <laughs> I have a Never met the first person who loves to pay taxes. Always that April 15th date brings us uh, into a, a, a bad frame of mind, and taxes are always a, a, a bad subject seems to break, bring up. I heard one fellow talk about it like this. He said, you know, the IRS, they say, you owe us taxes. And then you ask back, okay, how, can you tell me how much we owe you? No. And then you ask him back, you don't know? Oh, we know. We just aren't going to tell you. You've got to file your own taxes, and you tell us how much you think we owe you. And then you say, well, since it's so ambiguous, if we get it wrong, is that okay? No. What happens if I get it wrong? You go to prison. It's quite a system they've got. Taxes have never been a good feeling. Taxes aren't a good feeling to you. They also weren't a good feeling to Joseph and Mary. And we see, we, we see what's happening here. Taxes, there came a decree from Caesar Augustus, verse number one, that all the world should be taxed. As we see taxes were going on, but not only that, but we see there was a full house. You know the story so well, I don't even need to bring you to these verses, but it says there was no room for them in the end. There was a full house. Obviously, every room was taken. Every place was full up. You know, today in our culture right now, one of the biggest industries that people do is a side hustle, and that is to have storage units. There's some they just put over here, uh, one, one road down from us, down across from Dairy Queen, uh, storage units. We're a funny group of people. We say we don't have enough, but that's a big fat lie. We got plenty. We got so much stuff that we've already filled up our closets. We filled up our garages. Now, you know what garages are for, right? To park cars in. I know it took you a little while to catch because it's been so long since a car could fit in your garage. But they're supposed to be that you pull cars in. We're the only, only, only culture it is that we build two and three car garages and all three or four of our cars sit out on the, on the driveway. Well, we fill up our closets. Then we fill up our garages. Then we fill up our storage shed that we said was only for certain things. And we've invited everything else in there. And so then when those aren't big enough, what do we do? We've filled up our basement, our garages, our closets, our storage shed. Oh, we've got a good idea. Let's go rent for $100 a month. Let's go rent a storage unit. We're full up. <laughs> normal person would get rid of stuff, but nobody ever accused us of being normal, did they? I'm relating to this to our lives being full. And more than just that in being full, I ask you seriously this question. Was your life full of stuff last year so that you didn't give as much time to Christ as you should have? I'm not asking if you came to church every Sunday. I stand up here, you sit up there. We, I know pretty well. I don't remember every, every Sunday, of course, but we, I, I'm not asking did you come to church. I'm asking, did you let stuff get us full up so that we didn't give Christ the preeminent place that he's supposed to have? I see there was a full house I see that there was a full house, there was uh, taxes going on, but then I see also there was poverty. Look in chapter 2, the same chapter, but verse number 24. This family, Joseph, Mary, that they're going to get married, they are not of the upper crust. They are not of the ones that have all the upper echelon of society. Verse number 24, after the, Jesus, they go through the rituals and the, uh, that they are supposed to, and to offer sacrifice according to that which is said in the law, they were obeying the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The reason we know that poverty was a part of their life was because they were able to offer turtle doves or pigeons, and that's because that was for the people who didn't have enough money to offer what the rich folk offered. 
God, was, God has always been inclusive. We hear that word a lot now that we want to be include. God included everybody because He said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you mean inclusive, that you bring your sin along with it and say, Now, God, please bless this. God never has or ever will bless sin but he's always been inclusive. He wanted all of us to get in on his salvation that he provided. And so he also, in this day and age, under the law, he gave them the opportunity, whether they had a lot of money or very little of money, that they could participate in the sacrifices that were required. And so we see poverty as something that this young family, soon uh, early family, is, ha- has to deal with. And so it brings us down to where we are. We see what's happening. We see taxes are present, something that's not pleasant any time. We see there's overcrowding, and we see that they don't have the financial standing that they'd like to have. Now, tell me again why it is that we have problems. You know, we live in a very unique time in this nation, and that is when much of the Christian teaching that goes on on, online and on television much of it has this undertone, and that's what we would call prosperity gospel. But what it basically means is if you do right, God's going to build that bank account of yours. You say, why is it so unique? Because there's other countries that you could never preach that message because the greatest Christians, the most sincere followers of Christ in the nation have less than our poorest people ever would have in this nation. We just live in this very unique place where that heresy is accepted by a lot of people. So I'm saying to you today, you may be thinking, Brother John, God hasn't blessed me like He should have. God didn't bless Mary like you thought He should have either. God didn't choose a young lady based on her uh, financial setting. God didn't uh, bless Joseph based on his 401k or his, uh, his retirement package or what he had as a side hustle, how he was bringing money in. God didn't choose those folks to be used of Him because of their standing. He chose it because they They were highly favored above men and ladies, and he chose it because their dedication to him. But I see here what's happening. There's taxes. There's that burden being placed on them. There's that no room in the end idea. There's a full house, and there's poverty. Now tell me again, where are we falling on this equation? Is it your life that you're looking at saying, we don't have enough space for stuff. We don't have enough money for stuff. Or we've got problems that we don't like invading our lives. Join the club with Joseph and Mary. I see what's happening to them. But I see not only what's happening to them, I want you to see what that causes. I see not only what's happening in this story, but I see what it causes or what it brings about. I see, number one, it brings about overlooking. What do you think those shepherds were doing on that night when the angel announced to them the birth of the Messiah? They were doing what they'd done every night, watching sheep. Had it not been for the angel that announced the birth of Jesus Christ, they would have kept on going with all of their life. And as a matter of fact, every other group of shepherds who were out on those hillsides, every other group of people that were there, except for the specific groups that God had chosen to announce the birth of Christ to, they went on with life as normal. Can I tell you what most of our society is going to do right after Christmas gets over? They're going to go on with life just like they did before. Oh, we had a little pause when we pushed the pause button for just a little bit. We had a little bit of a rest. We had a little bit of a reprieve. We had a little bit of time when we set it aside to do some family things. But overall, people in this world and in this nation are going to continue looking over the Lord Jesus Christ just like they did before Christmas time. I believe that there are so many people, you understand the Bible still says, broads the way that leadeth to destruction. That means the bulk of the people are heading straight into a devil's hell. I believe that most of many of the people in our nation are looking over, ignoring, and going about their lives without knowing Jesus Christ, not because they're wicked, not because they're hatred, hatred of Jesus Christ, but simply because they're too busy. And they're overlooking. They're not looking at it in hatred, but they're overlooking. Let me tell you, take you back to that night. 
Every person that saw that lady, that young girl, virgin girl, that was ready to be delivered, everybody that saw her on her trip over there, and then as they found family they, that they were there as the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Every person who saw her uh, leading up to that time knew that something was happening in her life. It's hard to hide when they're expecting. But they didn't know who she was carrying. And I liken that to today, our culture. There's a whole world, a whole nation out here, I should say, that knows that something is going on this season. There's a whole nation out there that knows that something is different, special about December 25th when we celebrate the Lord's birth, whether it was then or some other time in the calendar. There's a whole section of people, a whole nation that knows that something is going on, something is different about that time, but they don't know who is different about that time. That's where we come in. Our job at Christmas time is the same as it is every other season of the year, and that is that we are supposed to tell folks about the Christ child. They didn't know who she was expecting. They didn't know what she was carrying. They didn't know what was uh, in the precious womb of that young girl. They didn't know all those things, but we know they were knew something was going on in the life of her, but they didn't know what. Do you know there were people that met Mary? I mean, the Bible doesn't record them, but you know it would have had to have been true. There were people that met Mary and probably gave her well wishes because of the baby she was carrying, but they never investigated ever to find out who Mary was bringing into this world. They were overlooking her. They were overlooking the Christ child. Men, ladies, you know what it's like to have uh, somebody overlook something. You send your husband into the kitchen looking for something. What's he do? If this is our kitchen, he stands right in the center. <laughs> Cabinets all wrong. And then you eventually, then you holler in. If your house is big enough, he gets a cell phone and calls you. If it's not, he just hollers back to the hallway. Where, where, where is the spatula? Where is whatever? And it's not that he hadn't lived there long enough. He just overlooks it. And I'm afraid there's people, or I'm not afraid, I know, there's people within a rock's throw of this church. They know something about this church that the cross is on the inside of the wall, cross on the outside of the wall. They know something's going on. But they're lost and on their way to hell. Not because they're wicked, I mean, except all of us are wicked. Not because they're hatred of this church or hatred of the cross. Just they're simply overlooking it. I see what this causes is an overlooking attitude. Then I see number two. I said, first of all, look at what's happening, those three aspects. But then what this causes is, number one, overlooking, just simply in neglect. But then number two, pushing Jesus out because of the world. Can I take you back, or not in Scripture, but just in your mind, you remember that Herod was going to kill all of the babies. When finally the wise men came along, a slightly later than this, when the wise men came along and as the wise men came to Herod, Herod said, I too want to worship the baby. Liar, liar. Robe on fire. <laughs> he wanted to worship. He wanted to kill. And he ordered when the wise men didn't come back for all of those babies to be murdered. And so we see when Jesus came, we see what's happening. And not only does that cause an overlooking, but then it also caused some people a literal pushing of Jesus out. You did the same thing I did. I've seen decorations all over our area, and some I see big old lighted presents in the yard. You know what's in those presents? If you're a little kid, you want to go up and see what's in those. Well, you're going to find out there's nothing in them. And I'm afraid that most of our world's Christmas celebration are about as full as some of those big packages out in the yard. They're about as empty or full as those things are. 
And I love Christmas season. You know that very much. You know that I love the time when we uh, can go into a worldly uh, department store and hear the, the, the Savior's name over the intercom because the Christmas carols. I love it. I love it because people are a little more likely to come to church. I love it because I get better receptions on my invitations to church. Hey, come to our candlelight service. Oh, I may do that. I love it because people are even calling the church this year and saying, when are those candlelight services? I love this season of year. I love all that goes on. But can I I tell you that most people's Christmas celebrations are about as empty as those packages that are up in the yard. You know those big old packages that are just there for decoration. And that's about as meaningful as most people have for their Christmas celebration. A little bit of lip service, a little bit of shutting everything down, but by and large, they pushed Jesus out completely of the whole equation. And my friend, I want us to be a group of believers. I would love, as the New Testament believers were told by the, the, the apostles there, I would love for us to be that group that finally got it completely. And we said, wait a minute, the message that's come to us is a delivered personally to us that now we're supposed to take out to this world and I'd love to give that message to you and to me today to say our marching orders are, as this new year gets started, that we don't let next Christmas come along in the lives of our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones and our coworkers without them knowing what the true meaning of Christmas is, without them knowing that Jesus Christ is the true reason for the season, so that next year they won't celebrate Christmas just like one of those big old empty boxes that have nothing inside of it. Instead, they would have a meaningful Christmas they would have a relationship with Jesus Christ and they wouldn't push him out. The world that night had no room for Jesus. And I hate to report to you because you know I love to give good news. I hate to report to you, but most of the world doesn't have any room for him now either. So the question remains, since I don't have all of the world here, I've got you. The question remains is, do you have room for Jesus? If you're here today and you know who Jesus is, I can't imagine there's somebody in this room that doesn't. You know who Jesus is, but really as you replay the memory of yours for all of your life, there was never a time when you look back that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Oh, you know about Him, and you've even sung about Him, you've talked about Him, but you've never had a time when you received Him into your life for the forgiveness of sins. My friend, Christmas is not so that we stop everything and have Christmas dinner around the Christmas uh, decorations. That's not what Christmas is. Christmas is when Jesus Christ came to this world to save you and I from our sins. And maybe you're here sitting and you're maybe you're a member of Buffalo Ridge, you're a member of some other good church, but you look back through your life and there's never been a time when you received Christ as your Savior, which is what He was, the Savior of the world, Messiah. You've never done that. Maybe there's been a lot of stuff going on in your life but you really haven't had much room for him either, then today, I'm going to ask you right there where you sit to simply open up your heart and your life and receive Christ, just like you received presents the other day, maybe yesterday, just like you received a present, somebody held it out and you just simply took it. Yes. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God offers you the gift from heaven, His Son, Jesus Christ, because He died on the cross. He was not only born as a baby, but He grew and He died on the old rugged cross and He was buried and He rose again. Three days later, miraculously, in every bit of His life and death and resurrection. And He did that so He could be your gift. And all you have to do to receive the gift, Jesus Christ, is simply receive it. By faith, accept it and ask Him to come into your life and forgive your sins. The Bible says without that gift, you will be on the hook. You'll be responsible 
for your own life and your own sins. And my friend, the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So that's, that's okay. I'm not afraid of dying. But the worst part about that is the Bible says not only will that be a physical death, but the Bible says in Revelation, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And so I either, either receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins or I am responsible for my own sins. And that equates to death and hell. You say, that's not a good story. Oh, it is a great story. Because the birth of Jesus Christ was getting us all out of that, if only we'll receive him. And so this morning, have you said up till now in your life, I don't really have room for Jesus? Oh, not that you've been hatred, hate, hateful toward him, not that you've, you've, you've been vehement against it. You just haven't ever got to a place where you said, I can receive him then today, I challenge you there where you sit to open your heart. Let Him come in, be your Savior, the forgiver of your sins. If you're here today and you have done that, but you take recount of your last year, and you say, Preacher, if I'm honest, I haven't given a whole lot of time to Jesus either. Oh, I know Him, I'm saved but I haven't given a whole lot of time to him either. The cares of this world has pushed out the name of Jesus. The cares of this world has pushed out that Bible reading that you talked about. The cares of this world has pushed out those family devotions. The cares of this world has pushed out me uh, serving at, at the church. The cares of this world has pushed all that out. You, you'd be somebody who's, you haven't rejected, you haven't pushed out Christ because of hatred. It's just been you but got busy. As I jokingly told you about all these storage units that are popping up everywhere, you just let your life get too full. And so today, I challenge you to make a change and say, Lord, I'm going to make sure you take first place. I'm going to make sure you take preeminent place in my life. And then we'll let all the other stuff fit in. In leadership uh, classes, they call that you put the big rocks in first meaning you put the big pieces of your life in, the things that really matter. And then if you've got room, then you put all the little stuff in. You put Jesus Christ. You put your family. You put the things that matter. And then whatever room you have left, that's good. But I would say there's a lot of us who have not rejected Christ, but we've neglected Christ this past year. We haven't had enough room. But I'm challenging you to make a decision today it's going to be different. I want to incorporate him in everything I do. So I don't know which category you fall into. Maybe you're that one that you say, I don't think I know Christ. Today is your day to receive him as a present that he is, the gift of God, into your life. And if you're here today, right there where you sit, wouldn't you make the decision where God knows what's going on down in the deepest, most thoughts of your heart to say yes to Jesus? I know you think there's a trick here that I'm going to call on you or that I'm not going to do any of that. But isn't it time? You've lived long enough. Isn't it time that you receive Jesus Christ for who he said he was and that was, is and was the Messiah, the Savior, your personal Savior? Would you bow your heads together with me? Now, Lord, I pray for somebody in this room, I believe, needs to call upon your name for salvation. And my friend, if you're that person, you don't have to come forward to me. You don't have to announce it to me. But you do need to admit it to God. Admit that you're a sinner in need of His salvation that he provided you're really you need to celebrate Christmas in the way it was supposed to be celebrated if you're here today you're not sure Christ is your Savior but you're saying I want to do what that preacher said I want to receive Jesus as my Savior you can borrow this prayer from me years ago I prayed a prayer something like this just silently there in your heart would you pray after me dear Jesus I know I'm a sinner I'm not good enough to go to heaven, 
but I know you died on the cross for me, so I could. I receive you as my Savior. Please come into my life. Save me. Take me to heaven when I die. If you're here and you're not sure that you've ever done that, well, I challenge you, right there where you sit, that you say, tell the Lord that you're receiving Him as the gift of God into your life for the forgiveness of sins. And then, Christian, to those of you who are saved, I believe some of us need to, and I say us <laughs> because it's me, some of us need to tell the Lord something like this, Lord, I have let things and activities and stuff and people push out my time with you this past year. Lord, forgive me. Help me to put you first, preeminent, this coming year. Believer, I trust that you pray something like that. We might as well get started early on those New Year's resolutions. Let it not be said that there is no room in my life for a walk with the Lord. Christian person, how many of you would say, I prayed that prayer. I want to give more time to the Lord. Would you lift your hand up and let me pray for you? I'm, I'm not going to come to you. My hand's up. I prayed it. I need to spend more time with the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you say, preacher, Brother John, I prayed while you were praying and I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And I'm lifting my hand up just to signify to you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm lifting my hand up to signify to you so you can rejoice with you. Say, you lift your hand and say, I ask Jesus to be my Savior. Anyone at all, lift your hand and say, I ask Jesus to be my Savior today. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, bless us now as our prayer. Help us not to, let it not be said about us. There is no room for us to seek for you. In Jesus' name. Would you stand together as the ladies play something through? If God spoke to your heart and you want to come and pray at this old-fashioned altar, it's open for you. There's no room in the end for, for Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. I don't want it to be said about me. There's no life, no, no room in my life for a walk with the Lord. Oh, I'm saved, of course. I'm thankful for that. But I don't want it to be said of me as a Christian. There's no, I didn't have any room for a walk with the Lord, my Bible time, my family, church, serving, Sunday school classes, bus routes. I didn't have time for all that. As you pray, May you dedicate yourself to the Lord for this next year coming up. Lord, I'm going to put you first. Preeminent place in my life. As they play one more verse, if God's speaking to you, would you do business with Him? Maybe you need to join Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church. That's not what I spoke on, but God's been telling you that's what you need to do. You got to come present yourself. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you have some other need. We'd love to meet you and meet See God meet that need. Okay, good. Well, there's... Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Well, it's a joy. If you need to slip out, I understand, but uh, we, it's always a wonderful time when we get to see a young family, and of course they bring a little one, and this one, Oliver Chase Garber, and uh, Austin and Kaylee are a great blessing to us, and uh, of course, Grandpa uh, Wade Garber uh, is a blessing, usually in junior church, helping with the ministries, bus captains, and just serving the Lord, and we're so thankful for them, but um, little Oliver Chase he is how old now? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. And uh, it's their desire to raise him for the Lord. And it's an exciting thing to see young people 
Not wait until kids get in trouble and then say, Preacher, can you help us? But instead say they want to dedicate that child to the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, if you know it, you can quote it with me. And I usually have our Sunday school teachers stand, but it's going to do all of us today. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. The parents of Oliver Chase Garber commit to raise this child in the ways of God and not according to their own, prayerfully following God's guidance, demonstrating an example of godliness and praying earnestly for this child. We dedicate him, but they do as well, committing to pray for him and raise him for the Lord's glory. I'm going to let you hold him, Dad, because sometimes it goes wrong. So, But you pray with me, dear Lord. We pray him for this family. We're so thankful for little Oliver. Lord, you gave us safe delivery. Lord, you've blessed and you've expanded this family now. I pray your richest blessings upon them. I pray you give health. I pray you give safety. Lord, we look forward to the time that uh, as he gets older and understands the gospel, he bow his little head and ask Jesus to be his Savior. Lord, bless this family as they dedicate this little one to you. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. What a joy. God bless you all. God bless you. Amen. Well, it's been a wonderful place to be. And I want to thank you for capping off your Christmas weekend celebration with us. I invite you back at 6.30 for the Lord's Supper service. It'll be a timely service, uh, a little shorter than normal. But um, we'll have a good time together there. But thank you for bringing those of you brought guests, your family and things from out of town. Thank you for coming. You are, you have made our day. And we're certainly thankful to have you here. But it's a joy to be back in God's house. Would you stand together with me? Thank you so much for being in church. God bless you. Merry Christmas. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.